Perry Grayson is joining joining us now. Uh, he's the former staff writer for Metal Maniacs magazine and the guitarist of Falcon, and he is writing the liner notes for the upcoming reissue of Death's Individual Thought Patterns. Uh, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Alex. It's good to be here again. Have you ever met Chuck? Yeah, I, I did. Um, I won't call um, saying hello to him at um, the the human gig in, in uh, early 92 meeting him but um, <laughs> I, I did meet him uh, in 98 um, when death came through on tour for uh, the sound of perseverance um, they uh, filmed the gig take the gig uh, at, the, at the whiskey um, in LA for for the um, live in LA death and raw DVD and I was okay. there and uh, I, I met him there, talked to him for a bit that day, but we really got a chance to hang out the next day in Ventura when, when they played the Ventura Theater. That was just utterly mind blowing to you know get to meet you know one of, one of your big music heroes you know one of mine anyhow. I met him. It was what December '98. I had a little bit of a, a sort of an in because um, the band that I used to be in, Destiny's in, and um, our singer was from Houston, Texas, and Shannon Ham is originally a Texas dude. Mm -hmm. So um, I got to talking to Shannon at, at the whiskey, and um, he sort of introduced me to Chuck and. We got to talking a little bit, and then, you know, they're like, yeah, come down tomorrow, come down tomorrow, and, you know, sure thing, I <laughs> I couldn't miss, and I, I went down the next day. And uh, we basically, me and and Shannon and Scott Clendenine, we hung out almost all day. Um, Chuck was there a bit. Actually, I was there at Soundcheck, or before Soundcheck, um, when Chuck was just sitting there jamming by himself. Just him cranking through his Marshall stack and, and um, I think I was like it was just me and um, maybe one or two other people in, in, in the whole Ventura Theater when he was doing that and it was just yeah mind boggling I'm sitting there watching one of my favorite guitar players of all time and he's just jamming you know <laughs> that's sick <laughs> and he just basically you know jumped off the stage um just before everyone else, you know, got there and was like, "Hey, man, <laughs> good to see you here again." And uh, I'm gonna put you on the I'm gonna put you on the door, you know. Uh, give me your full name and just you know, I'll put you on the door. And boom, away, away he went. And um, <laughs> you know, I was on the list and I was just totally stoked. Yeah, it was just mind-boggling. Here's Chuck up on stage by himself, jamming away on. So I'm sure he played riffs that he's just he just never recorded, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just I, I can't even tell you what he was running through, you know. It was uh, interesting stuff. I remember he was even doing a bit of uh, finger picking, which is kind of funny. Cool. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, then um, after sound check, you know, he just sort of came by again, and you know, just said, yeah, you know come back and and uh and definitely you know hang out after the gig and and i did and and um went on the bus and, and was hanging out with, with the guys and and just basically sitting next to chuck on the bus for probably a couple hours yeah it was it was uh, pretty funny um we were listening to uh pat boone in a in a mental mood <laughs> <laughs> that that album of uh, metal covers that Pat Boone did, you know, he's like Mr. White Bread, um, you know, 1950s like like, like Richard, um, Richard he, Cheese or whatever. He, he'd do like you know the the white bread version of of the the you know for lack of a better term the the black rock songs you know like whatever little richard or something he'd do like you know the sanitized version because they couldn't have you know down in the south they couldn't have like you know white teenagers listening to like little richard or <laughs> you know uh, or whatever you know <laughs> both Italy or something so he'd do the sanitized version so he did an album of you know metal covers <laughs> so the fist sake and and um so i did like um you know everything from like um quiet riot 
uh, you know, he did um, Metal Health and, mm-hmm. and to, to like Ozzy's Crazy Train and, and all of that. So we were listening to that and just, you know, ha- having a good laugh. And, um, and I, I remember um, the other tunes like the guys were throwing on. Um, Chuck and, and Oscar Droniak from Hammerfall, they had Hammerfall on tour with them, were uh, listening to uh, Stradivarius, who I don't really care for, but they were digging on Stradivarius at the time. And um, it was just kind of uh, what he was listening to um, at the end of the tour there. And um, I don't know, I just, you know, I was sitting there and, and trying to just not really uh, be a blabbermouth and, and talk cheers, and talk Chuck's, um, you know, ear off or anything. And um, we just, you know, we had, we had a good time hanging out. Um, I wouldn't say it was close to him, you know. People said uh, erroneously, oh, yeah, here's this guy. He was close to Chuck. I, I wasn't close to him. I, I met him. I, I talked to him. Um we didn't get to keep in touch because he, he got sick and and he didn't talk to a lot of people when he, when he was when he was sick i sort of i was talking to shannon um a lot online um after the tour ended and i'd just say you know hey shannon you know say hey to chuck for me and this and that but i, I didn't hear from him after after we met um it, it, those two gigs he got sick pretty soon after, uh, right after the tour almost, he started having the whole, um, he thought he, he just had a pinched nerve and, you know, well, it was a pinched nerve, but it was because it was a tumor, you know, mm-hmm. pinching the nerve. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that, that's how we met. We, we, like I said, had that connection um, because of the singer in, in my old band, Destiny's In, James from, from Hellstar. Um, Chuck had asked James, um, amongst other people, to sing for Control Denied, and that was probably about early 97 before Destiny's End even really existed. Um, he has World Dane before that, right after the Symbolic Tour, and... Um, Rob Halford. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, there was talk about that. Um, I think he was going to call Rob, but you got Tim <laughs> before yeah. that happened. No, but uh, yeah, he asked a few people, and, and all of them turned him down, including James. I didn't know about it until I'd been in Destiny's End for a little while. I was driving James around when he was visiting California, L.A. He knew how much of a big death fan I was, and, and we were just driving around, and he said, well, you know, Chuck asked me to sing for his other thing, and I went, control the night, because I already had a tape of, of, you know, a few tunes at least. I'll say several tunes, and I just went, "What?" And you turned him down. <laughs> <laughs> so we we already kind of had that in. I um, asked a, a good friend of mine at the time, Joey Severance, who was who was working for Metal Blade, the label we were on, um, to hand Chuck a copy of the first Destiny's End CD, "Breathe Deep the Dark," at the Milwaukee Metal Fest in in '98. So uh, being just a huge you know, Chuck fan that I am, um, I, I was like, I, I want to tour with Death somehow, somehow, some way. So I, I told Joey Severance, give this to Chuck, hand it to him, please. And he, and he did. So that was another way we sort of had it, had this kind of a little bit of history behind it. It wasn't just like some fanboy coming up, you know, <laughs> which I, I still am, or <laughs> was. Um, so there's a little bit of a, a thing behind it. And um, so I was talking to him on the bus about, well, is Control Denied going to tour, you know, when you, when you put the album out? And he was like, well, definitely, but, you know, first first things first, we got to, you know, record the album and, and we'll see where we're at. And so obviously, you know, they didn't tour mm-hmm. because Chuck got sick and, and they just barely were able to, you know, finish the first album and, and, and start this, you know, the second album and which, which still hasn't been released. Yeah. <laughs> now in, in your experience, uh, who was Chuck as a human being? Cause I know, uh, with some of the recent, uh, videos that were put out on YouTube with Chuck in Europe, courtesy of Eric Greif, of course, it shows, uh, the human side of Chuck. Uh, what was your perspective on that? 
you can see pre- pretty well from all of the the footage that's that's on YouTube of like interviews and stuff. What what sort of person Chuck was? He was he was really kind of mellow and he, he liked to joke around. He had a good sense of humor. He wasn't. Some people said, "Oh, he's, he was a monster." You know, he was he was an egomaniac and this and that. I, I didn't see that. Um, I, I guess if if you were in um, death with him and, and you weren't taking care of business, that that maybe you might see a different side of Chuck that that the other folks out there uh, wouldn't see, but. I saw a guy who was really down to earth and 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 just a total metal fan, um, as well as a musician and and just a really kind of you know fun loving, humorous dude. You know, uh, he had a really kind of a he can see you know from the footage um, almost like a surfer <laughs> surfer dude type kind of a a voice it's almost. Um, I mean. It's, he was a Florida guy, but um, kind of almost had sort of a um, almost a California vibe about him <laughs> in a way. But uh, even um, a little bit of a maybe a little bit of a twang just just towards the end. Like I, I started to notice, like just in, in the last couple of years that, that you'd see footage, and maybe a little itty bit of a twang in his voice for some reason. But. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, as as a as a human being, I think he was just you know a really down to earth kind of guy. And in another respect, I guess if if you got on his bad side because you know let's say um, <laughs> business people, you know, music business um, insiders, if they did the wrong thing and you know, weren't honest, I, I, they would definitely suffer the wrath of, of Chuck and I, I wouldn't want to be on, on the receiving end of that but um, at the same time I, I see Chuck's reason for uh, for being that way I'm a musician myself you know um, I, I've, I've had you know some, some pretty uh, you know uh, interesting experiences in the music industry over the, the past you know roughly what 20 years or so and, and uh, you know when you're dealing with, with uh, the the you know metal indie labels even you know your your bigger indies like metal blade and whatever and nuclear blast which you know death and control the night were on you know they don't always necessarily do uh the right thing and they're not always the most honest folks on the face of the earth so yeah i could see where chuck uh really you know with roadrunner or whatever you know he uh kind of maybe went off on a few people and i think it w- in a lot of those cases i think it was warranted i didn't have to see any of that i was just you know uh hanging out and having a good time <laughs> and i didn't see anything you know negative really at all um i think chuck was just a a guy who loved you know simple things like you know um his pets you know, it was had you know um couple, couple dogs well i think at one time he probably almost had he may have had three dogs at once but uh mm. he had a couple dogs and, and and cats and um you know he was really close to his family he was he was kind of a he was a bit of a, i guess you'd call it a, a an anachronism he was kind of like a, a real hippie-ish kind of dude he was like you know he loved he loved his weed um <laughs> He smoked a lot of weed, but at the same time, he was just Mr. Family, you know. He'd do anything for his mom. He, he, he was really kind of like a father to his nephew, Chris. You know, he was just a fa- he was, he was a real family guy. He, he um, had good family values and was really close to his sister, Beth, and, and stuff. And, and that's kind of, you know, it's kind of funny. He was a, you know, family-ish stoner, you know. <laughs> I didn't know, you know, that well that I could say, you know, okay, that this is exactly what went on in, in, you know, Chuck's house or whatever. But you know, I, I know a little bit, you know. You recently wrote an article for the a really awesome Death fan site called Death TR um, about your your relationship with a band called Nephobia and uh, 
how it relates to Chuck. Uh, d- describe describe that story because it, it, it's it's pretty interesting. Well, um, back in in the early days of the internet, I was what, about ninety, late ninety five, early ninety six. I um, was was on the internet back then. I was on the internet back in like I would say ninety three when it was just text based. Then you know maybe a year and a half later or so in in ninety five, just after um, Death played in in. Um, Played well on on tour uh, on the symbolic tour they played L.A. You know, of of course um, I was you know just sort of you know messing around on on the internet as I did back then and I um I found this band of phobia Florida um death thrash band um and their singer was was advertising all over the place on the on the metal and and heavy rock news groups about the band. And, he said that um, that that Chuck had, had played a guest solo on on their new CD that they were finishing up, and and that Gene Oglin had had um, programmed some drum tracks on on a few songs, and that Chuck had actually engineered um, one one of the tunes. That was all years. I was just like, wow, yeah, uh, Chuck's on it, and, I, and he he actually engineered this. Wow, you know, and Gene's on it too. Okay, I got to buy this. So I got in touch with, with Nick Chevalier, the the singer growler from uh Nephobia and, and um was just chewing his ear off about you know death and 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 actually even controlled an eye because just right after the symbolic tour um chuck sent around a postcard to the members of the metal crusade the, the death official fan club announcing that he was doing controlled an eye and the, you know you know uh keep an eye open for it so um, Nick from Nephobia mentioned that he, he was actually working on a website for, for Control Divide and he, he was, you know, getting pretty close to Chuck and all of that. And um, so, yeah, I just, I, I wanted to, you know, get the CD as soon as it was out. It wasn't, it wasn't out yet at that, at that point, like late 95, but um, a little while later, early 96, it, it was out and I ended up ordering it and um yeah sure enough there's there's chuck on on one tune playing a solo gene you know um program drums for for a few teams and um i was um trying to put together a, a metal scene uh it's sort of early to mid 96 with, with my old bass player mike bear we were calling it subterranean legacy and um we um, were trying to do a band together before that, but our band sort of fell apart. And um, we tried to keep it going by finding some new members and, and changing the name and stuff, but um, it just was slow going. So Mike ended up joining another band called Prototype, and, and we decided, hey, let's, let's do something together. Even though we're not playing together, let's do this metal zine, because I'd, I'd already been publishing for almost a couple of years at that point, I was doing a, um, a zine at the time called The Hunting Vortex. It was a fantasy horror fiction kind of zine nice. with a little bit of metal in there. So I just figured, well, we'll, we'll just do a, a full on metal zine. Mike didn't really have um, a, a lot of experience in that. I, I was the one that you know, had the publishing experience. And, I figured, you know, well, Mike will do a bit of work and I'll, I'll do, you know, a lot of it. But we just sort of, between the two of us, had too much going on in our lives to, to focus enough to, to get the, the bloody thing out. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up interviewing Nick Chevalier, the growler, singer, whatever you want to call it, from um, Nephobia for, for our zine that, that, that was never... Um, Publish even not even a single uh, issue made it out, and uh, a lot of years went by. Uh, let's see, it was uh, let's see that was 1996, so that's what 15 years. And I, I never uh, ran the interview anywhere. I mean, I, I I've been in heaps, tons of, of zines and, and mags over the past 15 years, and I never for whatever reason. I never gave that um, that interview to anybody. I just kind of fell by the wayside, and um, so 
finally, um, maybe about a month ago or so, I uh, decided to give that to Death TR, the uh, international group of, of uh, death fans that sort of um, really heavily, um, you know, uh, involved in things right now on the net with, with uh, people from Brazil and, and Turkey and Canada and well, Australia because of me. <laughs> Don't forget the, the US, UK. Whatever. And, and the all U of it. You James know, Copper. UK, got James Copper in the UK. But yeah, um, Mara Vanessa, the, the um, Brazilian you know, head of things, she um, was going on vacation for about a month or so, or just under a month, and she asked me what I kind of look after things for while she was away and contrib contribute some stuff. So um, I said, yeah, it's time to finally let um, some of this see the light of day. Now, the problem is that after 15 years, I somehow managed to lose the interview that I did with, with Nick from Nephobia. So I couldn't run that. But what I did run is I found um, a bunch of the emails that we exchanged. So I stuck the just raw emails up and I found an interview that a Spanish dude did um, from a zine around that time with Nick from Nephobia, and I stuck that up. So you've got um, pretty much the, the same um, questions I asked. I'm sure this guy asked, so you're not missing all that much. So you just go to um, deathtr.bogspot.com and, and, yeah, check it out. Now, was, uh, that the, was the whole CD recorded at Chuck's home studio? No, no, no. Actually, most of the CD was um, recorded in a studio in, um, I think it was Tampa. It was produced and co-engineered by Keith Collins, the former bassist of Avatar and Sabotage. He oh, did cool. most of the... Um, engineering and, and production work and they had uh, Gar Samuelson the um, deceased you know original Megadeth drummer um, produced a little bit for them as well I think at least um, a song or two so, and so um, Chuck it was, was like one or two tracks and, and Chuck just did one song he, he did um, I think it was called man my memory is kind of blank I think it was called as Ancients Evolve or something like that and he did he, he recorded it and he played a guest solo on it cool cool and Gene programmed the drums there was no there, there wasn't a human drummer on that on that particular um, track or a few others I think they lost their drummer somewhere through the um, the recording and the reason behind Nephobia um, getting involved with, with um, Chuck was that um, the Phobia's bass player was actually, back then, was, was Chuck's girlfriend's brother. So that's how they sort of hooked up, aside from the fact they were from the same area and they both kind of played, you know, similar, you know, kind of music. And, and Chuck was just beginning to start um, recording um, bands on his own um that's just sort of how it happened yeah i guess that's the story behind the phobia <laughs> what are the details of the individual thought patterns reissue uh i know eric said something about it coming out in a few months like october or something it's due out in october i don't know the exact day um i, I wrote the liner notes back in february late february early march been done with them for quite a while um i, I interviewed steve de giorgio again for it um talked to him in, in february um steve was really helpful and and i wanted to include steve because i had a feeling that um for whatever reason he probably wouldn't um be included like personally um in the liner notes so i wanted to make sure that he got in there um Steve's a, uh, an old friend. Um, I met Steve in, in the mid-90s, and he's a really cool dude. And um, I've interviewed him a couple times over, but um, he's, he's a friend. He's just a really uh, down-to-earth dude, um, amazing bass player. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and I just wanted to make sure that he made it into the liner notes. So I um, interviewed him, and, and there's a lot of Steve in what I wrote. Um, I needed to refresh my memory, so uh, I just had to talk to him. There, there are a lot of uh, interesting little anecdotes from Steve in there about, um, you know, uh, even before the actual recording. Um, and uh, a few things were left out of, of the liner notes just for um, a few different reasons. But uh, one, one of them <laughs> is just a goofy little tidbit that we couldn't really, we, we had to really kind of, I guess, keep it more or less sanitized. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, those guys used to, you know, they, they like to joke around and, and, um, Chuck's girlfriend was working at like a sort of a, I guess like a group home or whatever for like troubled kids or just mentally troubled people in, in general, maybe. Um, and, and so there's, there's in the thanks list for individual thought patterns, Gene goes, um, he thanks, uh, the rectal digger and. <laughs> <laughs> when I was, you know, like what I think it was about eight or something when the album, when Individual came out, and I read that, I just went, I was just like, what the hell is this all about, you know? And um, so I asked, I asked Steve back then, and he kind of told me the story behind it, you know. And it's, yeah, so it just goes back to Gene being really um, perved out and, and kind of. Uh, uh, being like really goofy with with Chuck um, and, and his girlfriend after she came home from work and just kind of you know like um, she was horrified by the things that were going on but Gene was just kind of like getting you know kind of getting off on the whole thing it was just really like <laughs> sort of uh, yeah goofing on it so I, I couldn't include that it's it's just you know one of those things so um yeah, something you won't see in my liner notes. And um, and Gene Hoagland um, for the liner notes of Individual. I've I've seen Gene's um, piece, and um, there's an itty bitty little um, like couple lines from from the recording engineer who um, did the um, the remastering and the remixing. No. When I say remixing, I haven't heard this, so I don't know what's been remixed and um, how it's going to be, you know, presented. Mm -hmm. So, uh, did, we'll did Sony to... lose all the masters for all the relativity releases, or I don't know? Ask Eric Greif. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. I remember um, around the time I um, was was writing the liner notes and interviewing Steve that Eric was asking around to see who owned um, a copy of the original Relativity um, LP, the vinyl of Individual. I only have the the European pressing of that, which was put out by Roadrunner. So I have a feeling that they're, I guess they were just trying to get, probably get a hold of the original like LP artwork and stuff. I, I doubt they were using the vinyl to remaster individual thought patterns off of but it's something i really haven't asked eric about or drew jergens from from relapse they've been kind of tight-lipped about exactly what's going on with, with the individual i asked back then oh what what's the bonus material uh, di didn't hear anything from them i mean eric's a cool guy and i didn't i didn't um think that he even really knew at that point he was gonna be a, on there. What he was talking about is they they just have a box of shit and they just uh, whatever, and that, I guess wh whatever is first done first goes. Uh, so I guess they're probably we're just going th didn't have everything compiled yet. There's no rhyme or reason from um, what I understand from from what Eric's told me and and other folks out there they just take you know he just takes every release as it comes you know um just no way to just you know just systematically go through it because it all depends what's left what's there um i do know i'll tell you this much and this comes from uh, again my liner notes um they uh death w was actually um working on a cover uh, just like they, they covered 
Kiss has got a thunder on on human. Well, uh, during the human sessions, uh, made it on the the Japanese release and made it on um, the At Death's Door Two um, compilation album. They were working on a cover. It was uh, Possess Exorcist, um, and it, it didn't get very far. I'll tell you that much. Um, I, I was I was talking to Steve about it a long time ago. Um, I think when I first actually met Steve, uh, went went up to the Bay Area. Uh, I mean, I was a SoCal dude, so mm-hmm. going up to the Bay Area is a you know good drive. So I drove up there and had a. Um, a really good friend up there and and uh we went and visited steve and sadis um in the studio while they were recording uh a track and and i was talking to steve about individual and stuff and 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 he said well you know we did this we started to do this this possessed track and it didn't get very far and blah blah blah. and so after so many years i kind of you know i still remembered about that and i was like what what the hell happened to that so I asked him about it again, and, and he said that, that basically, well, Gene knew the song kind of better than Chuck on guitar, so it, it kind of got pushed by the wayside because they really didn't have a lot of time, and it just, you know, they never they never finished it. There was never any vocals on it, and um, I have a feeling that um, it is going to be on the reissue, much to uh, Gene and, and Steve's probably uh, distaste. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think they're going to be very proud of, of, of what's there because it, it's probably just like basically like, you know, the only thing that's a keeper probably is like maybe the drums, maybe it's like scratch tracks, you know. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if Gene actually played a guitar track on that. <laughs> Because Gene actually does play guitar, and he wrote a lot of material for Dark Angel. Oh, that's cool. A lot of people don't know that, but um, yeah, Gene actually uh, is pre- pretty outspoken about that, and and he said he used to um, write a lot of stuff, a lot of riffs on um, twelve-string acoustic guitar nice. tuned down to D. <laughs> <laughs> do you know? Do you know any uh, details about further death reissues or the? Second Control the Night album, or any more uh, music videos? Um, I I don't know really anything about what's coming up with, with with the other reissues. I don't know what's next after Individual. I mean, obviously we still have you know Scream Bloody Gore, Leprosy, Spiritual Healing. Those three for sure left because they were um, all combat albums. Relativity owned them, so you know that they were they're they're part of the package that Eric has uh, leased from Sony. Sony owns all of Relativity stuff. Beyond that, I mean, human, you know, we, we've just got that, so. Obviously, we, we uh, know that the second Control Denied album has been delayed even more because of the Morris Sound uh, robbery, all of the gear that got stolen from there, and Did I don't any, even... any, like, important hard drives with any, uh, or, or anything that can't be replaced? <laughs> Like uh, Eric just kind of said, you know, a few months back that, uh, yeah, obviously there's going to be more setbacks. So I don't know exactly what the story is with, with, with where man and machine collide or the reverse of that, where machine and man collide. I don't know exactly what, what the title. I think it's where man and machine collide, actually. I don't know, you know, what's going on with that. I don't know where it is. Um, as far as I know, Tim Amar hasn't done his vocals, and you know Steve has, Steve DiGiorgio hasn't done his bass. Shannon Ham hasn't recorded his solos, so that's I think the end of that right now. Where that's at, I think Symbolic came out already like mm-hmm. a few years half, ago, three years ago yeah. on Roadrunner, and um, that was pretty cool. But I think. It probably could have been done a little bit better. Yeah. Um, it was all right. It's all right. What What did you I'm make glad. of the the uh, breaking the broken video? It's cool. Um, I, I dig it. I like it. Um, it's been a lot of yeah, a lot of really exciting things going on in the whole death control denied Chuck Schuldiner realm the past 
you know, year mm-hmm. or just over a year. So, um, yeah, that's one of the things. The human ratio thought, was definitely flooring. It was wow. so yeah, awesome. It, I'm just, I'm still absorbing it right yeah. now because it arrived about, uh, literally, I'm not joking, about, what, three days ago. Oh, really? Not even, yeah, two and a half days ago. So, I'm just, yeah, I'm blown away by the remix of, of Human. I, I just love it to death. I, I can't believe how cool it is to hear Steve DiGiorgio's bass loud and clear after, mm-hmm. you know, sheesh, 20 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, I bought that on the day. It, actually, um, I take that back. I think I, I actually managed to score a promo of that <laughs> before oh, nice. it was released. <laughs> so, I've, you know, it's 20 years now, and I've always said, man, they had Steve DiGiorgio play on this album but you can only hear him in like you know two or three little itty bitty locations so Mm -hmm. no it's like loud and clear it's it's awesome oh yeah the video though going back to the video um yeah doug cook and and his crew did a uh, you know tremendous job with that um i think my only criticism is is the the rather fake looking reaper (laughs) (laughs) but there's not much you can do about that (laughs) Oh, I just watched this awful trauma movie from um, some Russian people, and it's basically like this old late. It's discuss uh, if you, if you ever run across a movie from trauma called Shameless, Tasteless. Watch it. Watch it. <laughs> it it's, uh, is, it's, it, is it even more brutal than Killer Condom? It, it's I worse. Couldn't... It's worse than Tales from the Crapper. If you've ever seen that, I was funny in just how unfunny it was. <laughs> 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 yeah. But um you know, Doug, Doug Cook and, and, and their crew, um, you know, um and the crew did did a really good job on the breaking the broken video and I hope that he's gonna do more because um you know, we could sure use some more uh death and, and control denied videos. Mm-hmm. Uh two two is kinda, you know, is it's, it's I hope they get reissued on like MTV Two Headbangers Ball. That'd be, that'd be you know the peak of or it, it, it'd be it'd be so cool to see that just a, a premiere or something like that or a Chuck Day. Yeah. Well, that would be pretty amazing. I mean, back back in 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 my day, um, just seeing lack of comprehension and um, you know and the philosopher on, on you know more or less like. I'm not gonna say prime time, but close enough. MTV was just wow. I mean, they they played they played both on Headbangers Ball and obviously um, Beavis and Butthead did, did um, the Philosopher and just you know they, they hated it, but who cares? They hated everything. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, it was it was amazing. You know, I, I never expected to see Death on MTV. I was used to stay up and 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 watch, it, especially you know like seriously the last you know even even up to the last hour of, of Headbangers Ball, um, the third hour you know and just wait for the those last like few videos and always throw on something really heavy so you know they threw on you know lack of comprehension you know and in you know ninety it was like ninety one ninety two and. Wow, <laughs> it was a big coup. It was huge. It was it was it was enormous. And then to see you know stuff like I don't know, um, carcass or whatever on there too, mm-hmm. just or obituary. You know, it was a big coup because that music was just you know not the sort of thing that was mainstream yeah. by any. I mean, I can tell you back then I was one of probably I could count it on on two hands. In, in my high school, I was one of maybe, yeah, it's pushing it for 10 people who, who were, you know, was into death or, you know, any of those bands um, back then in, in, in the, you know, late 80s, early 90s, 89 through, you know, what, like 93, you know. It, it was kind of, it's kind of a shame that with the MTV thing that, that we didn't really see um, more of, of death 
or Chuck until really pretty much um, the end. You know that that yeah. little interview with Chuck before he went in for for surgery. The one the little interview with Kurt Loder. Um, I still haven't seen the full entire thing of that. Uh, it was just a clip. Yeah, it was, it was only a, it's only a clip on YouTube. It was tiny. It was a little itty bitty clip. I can remember that. I, I didn't even see it on MTV. I saw it uh, online originally. It was it was only like you know a little itty bitty clip. So it, it was it was a weird it was a weird thing. Death didn't have a video for symbolic. They didn't have one for uh, the sound of perseverance. You know, and and they didn't really you know pay much attention. Um, until Chuck was, you know, practically on his deathbed, you know, mm -hmm. and even then it was just this itty bitty little, you know, like 30 seconds thing, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, at least they did it, I guess, you know, um, that's one of the things, um, I remember about when, when Chuck passed away, um, there were no obituaries in like I, I scoured the the Florida newspapers, like Orlando, or whatever. There were no obituaries. Would you believe that? No, I, there, did, there I did not a single, know that. There was not not a single obituary in a, a major Florida newspaper. There was like one in a little itty bitty like local music rag from Orlando. A guy who sort of wrote a hard rock and metal column to sort of you know, mention it. I think Chuck had um, loaned this guy a Marshall cabinet at one point because he was a musician. He just, you know, mentioned it. Otherwise, not a single obituary in a newspaper. It's just kind of depressing in a way because people, mainstream people just didn't care didn't pay attention all because you know i guess death you know the name had whatever negative connotations to it or something or maybe you know yeah obviously you know some people couldn't get beyond the vocals but by the time chuck passed away we, we did have you know the control denied album so you know at least it was something with, with normal clean sung vocals on it you know you would think that you know, his, his local, you know, Orlando newspapers could, you know, at least give him a little itty bitty, maybe even like an inch, you know. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, kind of pissed me off. Well, uh, let's let's talk let's talk a bit about Falcon now. Is Falcon Australia based now, or do you have to travel for no. music stuff? <laughs> Uh, I, I started Falcon in 2002 when I was still living in LA, mm -hmm. and, and um, it, it's definitely um, it's my American thing. Um, it, it's um, do you travel back and forth a lot? Or? Well, um, I, we haven't actually recorded since our second album um, in in 2006, and it was released about. Uh, almost a year and a half later so we haven't recorded since but we're going to record another album next year um i'll travel back for that um anytime there's anything to be done as far as you know if it's some really cool gig comes up or um obviously this recording uh yeah i mean i'll, I'll travel <laughs> no problem with that but um it's Falcon has always been something that um, we've done um, very spontaneously. It's not something that uh, I overthink or um, beat to death um, with over rehearsing because Falcon is totally like the the late sixties, early seventies power trio, heavy rock vibe. It, it it would be the wrong thing to pick the tunes to death and, and to over rehearse on like the whole jammy vibe and, and all of that. So we, we actually do a lot of, you know, jamming on stage even, you know, like we kind of prolong solo sections out and, and whatever and do a lot of impromptu jamming on stage. And, and uh, we also, you know, really just kind of concentrate on rehearsing 
right before we record as opposed to like just sitting there in the studio in the rehearsal studio that is for like a year before we go cut an album i think that kind of defeats the purpose of, of that style of music kills the whole really you know spontaneous vibe so we did a lot of stuff by distance as far as pre-production my, my drummer darren mccloskey um he lives in pennsylvania so I'd send Darren and, and you know, um, Greg, my bass player, Greg Lindstrom from Sarah Thungal. Um, I'd send them tunes so that they could just, you know, come up with their, their parts, you know, come up with, with their bass line or their drum part, you know. Um, and then we just, we'd get together um, for maybe three or four days and rehearse before we actually um recorded and um you know for a while we had um a live drummer in la playing with us a, a different drummer a friend of mine andrew sample and he helped us out so that we could play a lot of gigs in in southern california but um darren mccloskey is very much the, the drummer in 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 falcon he, he's got the total vibe he, he, he's just a total brother, you know, uh, in, in a lot of ways. And, and he, being in Pennsylvania, um, we just really do a lot of um, our work by me sending him uh, files over the Internet or sending him a CDR. And we've always done that since this is going back to when I first asked him to play in Falcon in 2002. So it, it's really been pretty painless and, and easy to do that it's the style of music that, that really lends itself to you know not um beating things to death in a rehearsal studio for like you know two years before you go record an album <laughs> for lack of a you know a lengthy story there <laughs> all right well uh thanks for stopping by the show again your number one source for independent music, independent talk, and independent mind starts right now. This is Free Thought Radio.